Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone uh, listening to us today. Uh, my name is Reem Qasem. I'm your moderator uh, for this session. I'm a co-founder of Bosita and um, a performing arts programmer at the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi. Our session today is titled Strategic Partnerships and Collaborations. And we have three speakers. Uh, we have today Heba Hash Felder, who is a senior program manager at the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture. We have Rathi Jaffer, director of Inku Center in India. And we have also Raid Serhan, culture manager, Red Bull Jordan. Um, I would like to start this session uh, by asking uh, uh, Heba. Uh, representing one of the leading institutions that support artists and uh, uh, cultural institutions in the Arab region and beyond, uh, about her point of view uh, of what are the forms of strate strategic partnerships and alliances that she sees missing in, in the cultural sector uh, in our region and even globally. Thank you, Reem, uh, and thank you for hosting us on this uh exciting platform. Um, as you probably know, I mean, the region is quite weak in terms of public funding, in terms of incentives that can support the arts and culture sector. And one of the critical areas in terms of creating and developing more strategic partnerships is to have uh, diverse partners supporting the sector. And so one of the gaps, but also one of the great potentials is to encourage more individual philanthropists. And there's so many of them in this region. People who share um, values related to freedom of expression, who want to nurture creativity in the region and want to see it grow. And there's so much talent out there that can be supported through a diversity of, of, uh, of partnerships. The other um, sometimes missing a possibility is the involvement of the private sector and yeah. the potential it has to invest in in terms of uh, impact investment and to see that the kind of funding which goes to support artistic works and artistic projects is about social investment and I think there's a lot of potential that can happen there. Uh, that said, despite the, the, the dearth or the gaps in public funding a lot of donors, and we have long-standing donors at AFA, have been supporting the sector and have kept it alive. Uh, and we're very thankful for those who see the value and the importance of supporting more long-term and unrestricted, meaning supporting uh, core operations of institutions. Um, I can give examples, but maybe I give the floor to you. Um, in a minute. Okay. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe give us a few examples. Okay. I mean, and this is to talk about something that has happened, which is very positive in a crisis situation, and mm. where you see how partners come together to address uh, needs, but also priorities, and to think beyond the crisis into the stage where we're talking about early recovery or post crisis, the health pandemic, I think, brought everyone uh, uh, on their knees. And the arts and culture sector being very much part of a, of a local economy, of the local society, was terribly affected. One of the things we did in AFOG, aside from adapting our own programs to make sure that we can be responsive, is to think together with other partners. In this case, it was AFOG and Culture Resource, Al Mawrid Al Thakafi. Um, who came together and said, what is it that we can do in a crisis situation like the one exemplified by Lebanon, where you not only have a health pandemic, you also have uh, a 30-year economic and financial crisis that's now compounded by confinement, by uh, a terrible political situation. And so the two regional partners said, let's come together and create an initiative in solidarity of mm -hmm. arts and culture organizations in Lebanon. And this is what happened. And this call was so well received that we have three of our common long-standing donors on board, so Open Society Foundation, Sport Foundation, 
and Drosos Foundation, uh, who are generously supporting this joint initiative. Uh, and with this fund, we aim to support 23 independent cultural entities in Lebanon. So this is one example, the Lebanon Solidarity Fund. The other one, and this time it's not only with our long-standing partners, but also with the private sector. It's the Artist, um, Artist Support Grant, which aims to support around 150 artists across the Arab region who are affected by the pandemic and who want to continue working and may not have the means to do so. And this partnership, um, in addition to some of our uh, institutional donors, like Ford Foundation and Open Society Foundations, was made possible because of the, the strategic partnership with Spotify. And Spotify mm -hmm. is matching all the donations earmarked for music. Uh, and we've created a, a page under Giving Loop. So we're also exploring crowdfunding. Uh, and so in times of crisis, one has to look at different funding mechanisms and call on different partners and friends to support, but also to create throughout the years the type of partnerships that allow you to respond in mm -hmm. times of crisis in an effective way. Yeah. Thank you very much, Heba. That takes me to uh, the um, topic sector resilience. And when uh, when we all were under lockdown in March, I started doing some research on sector resilience. And there are several people who have mentioned to me in this uh, um, uh, with the, during the research that an arranged marriage has to happen between the. Uh, uh, private sector, culture sector, public sector, and we have to all come together in a different way uh, during such a period. And uh, so my next question is to Rafi, and I want to ask you, what are the tactics in your point of view that the sector should have developed earlier? And if the sector had developed those tactics, it could have been more resilient in the face of such a crisis. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me on this panel with uh, uh, my co-panelists, all of whom come with some wonderful experience and looking forward to a lot of learning on this session and hopefully contributing as well. I want to set in context the work I do currently. I head the Indo-Korean Cultural and Information Center in India, in Chennai, India, South India. And he used to work before that for about 10 years with the British Council, making links between South India and the UK more specifically. Um, and the learning points from both these assignments has been exactly how to find that equitable balance between private and public partnership. And I liked your word of an arranged marriage because I think as opposed to a love marriage, I suppose, They're both in terms of uh, expectations and in terms of boundaries, there are some things which are set in place and need to be set in place for smooth sailing. So in India, as you know, because of the diversity of, of, of the arts, a lot of which are in the informal sector, there isn't exactly a kind of a fund set up, although there is a Ministry of Culture, it works pretty much in silos. We've not yet moved to a stage where the creative sector is seen as a creative industry contributing to economy. Therefore, it still remains tantalizingly on that edge of non-essential. And we've got to fight all the time to, to make, through our projects, make people and our stakeholders aware of just how essential this is. So when we say ephemerally that it's about changing hearts and minds, it's about keeping a positive frame of mind. In this pandemic, it's about wellness and you know not allowing yourselves to get locked down mentally. All of this is very difficult to quantify. And in terms of all impact studies, you know that it's not just the quantitative numbers we're looking at. Qualitatively, it becomes really difficult to quantify. So when we work, and especially with this particular assignment with the INCO Center, it's a rather unique model where it's completely funded by corporate support. And it's corporate support for the arts and it's corporate social responsibility and all of that terrain that comes with it. With the, with the government, it's been pretty much arm's length. It's been about bringing them in, in terms of administrative, you know, to clear administrative hurdles, 
to make sure that large festivals can happen in open spaces where you need permissions for instance you need to have them to not really interfere with that independent space that you have so i think it's about that critical move of partnerships partners being defined more as partners rather than sponsors especially when it comes to the corporates who we have on board so we are supported by the two uh, uh, the from the korean side it's the hyundai motor india um um uh, the hm hmil in india which is the largest uh, second largest in terms of automotive uh, both domestically as well as in terms of uh, exports and tvs motor company which is the third largest bike company in india with plants in germany and other parts of the world in indonesia and other parts of the world so the question that begs answer is that why should these companies really think it's important to support the arts and what about the offering that you make is really enhancing their brand through a sort of dotted line in terms of positively changing people's uh, mindsets um, you know understanding and appreciating korea and india and thereby by extension korean indian products but having said that we will staunchly not have you know products lined up we will not have eyeball spaces for any of this we will work with them as valued partners each one bringing a certain something to the table yes so i want to emphasize on that aspect of equitable partnership with government and and uh, the private and public sector because otherwise it can get very badly skewed of course and that independent space for artists which is very precious and needs to be protected and respected nurtured will yeah. will uh, be at risk yes of course so, it can be very challenging for artists to find a common language with the, uh, either the government sector or the uh, public sector that's uh, really uh, i've seen so, so many examples where artists they are at the end they are forced to do something that they don't believe in or something that doesn't necessarily meet their uh, um, mission as an as an artist or their artistic career mission I completely agree and actually in co center we play that intercedary role we our logo itself is which is which carries the colors of both countries are actually like a bridge mm. so as a bridge between artistic endeavor and aspiration ambition and then converting it into the language of what corporates might take on or the government might listen to is i think a very critical role so it isn't a direct when we take up a project the proposal making a come the proposals come from the artists but the presentation there is an intervention there so in the manner in which it is put across so that both sides are uh, uh know what to expect from this nobody goes away disappointed or nobody goes away and there's no hierarchy there in terms of somebody forcing most often it is uh, you know forced upon the artist so we would like to prevent that at all costs yeah so we so do a combination of presenting work full fledged work allowing for indo-korean collaborations and touring where it comes in both countries and beyond so when it goes beyond then it's outside our remit of funding but within there's a lot of scope for research and development and support both for independent artists as well as for those who you know come up on uh, performing arts platforms where you can go in seoul there is every year there is a performing arts uh, market which happens where you go there and you can meet and talk to people and then invite them on equitable terms to your country so we do a combination of all of this because we feel in the trajectory all of it is important yeah absolutely okay so that uh, also uh, takes me to uh, uh my question to Raid about uh, from your point of view as an ex musician and also as a founder of the culture department in Red Bull Jordan uh, maybe you can you can share with us some of the uh, models you have adapted to support the musicians we all we all know that Red Bull is one of the biggest uh, uh, companies that um, organize some um, music events with and support uh, support the musicians as well but at the same time it's a private sector company uh, and uh, how these models have have had long impact uh, on the musicians careers um first of all thank you reem for moder moder moderating this session and thank you uh, for hosting me with this lovely panel um uh, to answer your question um first you must identify the right talent so what does that mean 
um, non-commercial and developing artists with potential artists that have the drive and ambition to put in the work. Um, see, artists have to start treating the music industry for what it is, which is an industry, a business. And you can't survive in it if you look at it from one side. You need to have a business side covered as well. Have a business plan. Um, market yourself. We shouldn't be too hard nowadays with social media. And you know that sounds bad to some musicians and like they're selling out. But sometimes you have to play the game to have a fighting chance. Um, have a part-time job. Create a side business to increase your longevity in your music career if, if it's struggling. Each artist is a brand. And just like any company, you need to grow that brand. So once we've identified the right talent, we look at what's missing. Is it a master DP producing a record, social media presence, maybe the right venue or festival to perform at, more exposure? Depending on, the, on, on these factors, either we provide the artist with studio time, assist in the recording of their music, or push their social media platforms through hours and hour connections, um, or produce events around them where all the attention is focused on them through a 360 campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, we just go to continuity. Um, once we've started work with working with an artist, we keep, we keep supporting them, we keep supporting them through thick and thin, trying our best to bring their ideas to life as long as they're active and willing to put in the work. I mean, let's face it, I mean, these days, I mean, you could become irrelevant in two to three months because it's just fast paced, fast moving. So you need to stay out there, you need to keep making music and keep raising the value of your brand as a musician and mm. just stay relevant. Yes, exactly. And staying relevant also makes me ask, um, I understand that now the music business is facing lots of uh, challenges due to uh, canceling the events, postponing the events, especially the events that have a um, large number of audiences, public, big public events. And um, that makes me curious, and I'm sure that so many other cultural managers are curious as well to ask, how are you going to um, keep uh, build on the success that you have already achieved by readapting uh, yeah. new strategies during this time? Okay, like, like I said earlier, you need to stay active and out there to stay relevant. So we just moved everything online. Live performances with artists, interesting stories about them, content that revolves around them as people and their music. Of course, it's not the same as the real thing, but as long as you keep the fans engaged and the musicians working and getting paid, then it's, a good, it's, it's good enough for the time being. So yes. that's pretty much it. Yeah, have, have you been finding any challenging in doing that? Because I'm asking because from my personal experience also here in the UAE with the Cultural Foundation, we've also moved all our, all our programs online. We've, uh, we've been programming um, young bands, also international artists and local pop stars like Cousin Seher, uh, Hussein Al Jasmi, and we've been struggling in, uh, um, in, uh, in numbers. Achieving achieving yes achieving higher high viewership at the beginning people were, were were under lockdown there were curfews so yes they were watching sometimes not not the full performance but now we're finding it challenging and we feel that the, the social dynamics are changing rapidly and we need to as you said keep keep up to what's going on yeah see so, the thing is Sorry, uh, see, the thing is about, about everything moving online. I mean, it was in time of necessity just to keep everyone engaged and to keep the artists uh, working as well. But the thing is, you're missing the human element. And that's why, in my opinion, online will never work and it will never replace the real thing. I mean, if you look at the, the statistics, most people, most if 85 to 90% of people go to festivals to see other people for the atmosphere, for for other people, not just to watch the artist on stage. That's a huge part of it. But also they want to be engaged in the whole experience. They want to experience this thing. But when you move everything online, you're losing the, 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 the human element of it, mm. which makes it difficult. And now with YouTube and all the platforms, you can just go on any platform at any time and watch a full concert for any artist you want around the world at your own convenience, rather than just waiting for someone to do something online live. And at the same time, you'll watch it during a real concert where you can actually see the crowd.
But what people want to do, they want to interact with others. They want to see other people. So maybe an integration through Zoom, for instance, where you can see other people online and their reactions to such a live performance would make it more interesting. Mm. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Rod. So, yeah, and as we say, sometimes this disruption helps us stop, think, evaluate, re re rethink things and plan make new strategies. And uh, here I would like to ask uh, um, uh, Hiba, um, at this time, do you think that we should take some new actions to build new strong alliances or new forms of partnerships for the sector? Thank you, Rim. Um, part of developing resilience in, in, in crisis is, is actually doing a lot before a crisis happens. I mean, one of the gaps that we find, um, because a fog has been in operation for longer than 13 years, and we've invested heavily in, in cultural creativity and productivity, but there's still so much to do in terms of making those um, artistic works, whether it's in, in music or theater or dance or photography or film, to make them heard and seen. Uh, as Ra'ed uh, was just saying, in terms of having people uh, access those festivals and events, but also offering opportunities for young people to engage in, in the sector. And so one major gap that remains is the whole concept of distribution and circulation. Uh, and for this, uh, what we find missing is not only the, the public infrastructure, that, that should stand to create uh, a, a platform where more people have access to culture, but also the type of support that small and medium cultural institutions would need to build within their own local context, strong entities that can engage with an audience, that can entice people to be uh, involved in, in, in cultural uh, projects. Um, in that sense, building an ecosystem requires not only grants for individuals, but also support to local cultural entities. And the only way to do that is to have this diverse uh, partnership base and to get people on board to see arts and culture not only as an add-on, but something very integral to mm. people's well-being. And in our region, the news that often hits us is about wars and calamities and repression, um, violence, uh, gender inequalities, you name it. But it would be much more interesting to also see what does it take to put in place the very open spaces and civic spaces and to grow and nurture them so that people have something else to fall back on and, and to see that even in those dire contexts, there are so many talents that are out there that need to be given the space to perform and to create. Um, and so in that sense, the kind of sustained partners and donors, whether they're institutions or government agents or individual philanthropists uh, or the private sector, they need to come together and make sure that their joint resources are put at the service of, of the sector. Um, one thing we did during the crisis, and, and this I would like to uh, just develop an idea that Ra'ed was talking about. I mean, the, the online platform has both its positive and, and negative sides. But what we found was that when people were confined, there was so much more hunger and, and uh, eagerness to go online because that was the only space that ironically a lot of artistic works got to be seen a lot of uh, films were watched and music was heard uh, as an example of what we did in Afro was a week and streams program where we showcased many of our uh, uh, artists that we've supported in the past and had them made had their work visible and so there is this uh, this positive aspect to it but I would agree with that it that nothing replaces the kind of um, cultural spaces and the type of uh, events and venues that bring people together that make us share 
these moments of happiness, uh, but also to critically look at what ills and ailments are in, in society. Yeah. I totally agree with you, but I also have some, you know, experiences from when I, when the time when I used to work in Egypt, I used to head the performing arts department at the Library of Alexandria, and I had an NGO called Agora that um, used to organize public space festivals. And um, for a period of, you know, seven years, I've tried to work with uh, disadvantaged communities and engage women uh, uh, who were. Um, under uh, fragile or under risk, unemployed, uh, work with street children, and so many um, very, very fragile target groups. And now I'm here, and my colleagues in Egypt have uh, continued the, the mission. But I, I keep hearing that during this time, so many cultural institutions in Egypt are shutting down. Maybe two or three are, uh, are uh, still uh, a bit resilient. And yes, more or less and uh, those independent cultural uh, cultural institutions are unable to continue they are they are not only f if they were able to sustain themselves and be a little bit resilient in the face of um, the system and the, the policies now given the uh, the crisis the health crisis it has become really very difficult because also funding has been cut and it's always cul culture is the is always the first thing that gets cut when there is a financial crisis. That is very true. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. And having, having thought about, having said th this, uh, I, I may be repeating myself, but I keep thinking about how can culture become, how can the sector become really re more resilient so that in the future, because we've been working a lot during the past decade, and I don't want to say that we are hitting a uh, reset button. I don't want to say that, but I feel that we are about to reset. So that when the time comes after another dec decade to reset again, the sector is more resilient. So what do you think? What do you think? What, what can the sector do to avoid hitting the reset button again? Maybe this is an open question to to the three of you. May I? Go ahead. Please. Yeah. I want to just pick up on what Raid said about the human element, which makes it so completely different in terms of experience. You're sitting in a darkened auditorium, you're work, wait, waiting for the artist to come up there. There's a connect that happens and you're literally feeding off each other in terms of energy. When you're consuming art online, uh, music online in this instance, of course the magic is there depending on how your camera angles are, how it's placed, what the audio reception is, how your internet is, etc., etc. But leaving all that aside, there may be somebody at the door who needs your attention, you stop it and come back again. You're consuming art in a very, very different way and the impact there, therefore is also very, very different. It is very important to make the trans transition during these troubled and unsettling times because you don't want to be out of sight, out of mind. But also to keep in mind that there is a tremendous sense of fatigue when we do something that is in a sense a little unnatural. Even this conversation, I would love to be sitting across the table in a room talking to all of you but we do it because this is a situation and the condition we are under. But there's no, I mean, I think we we shouldn't kid ourselves that it's just an easy transition and whatever we've done, we could just now bring it online and look at the numbers and then stay happy that we are, we are still connected. This, the, 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 the pandemic has asked us to hit the pause button and to reflect on our practices. I don't know whether it would be reset. I think we will go back to having parallel tracks. It also means when we are revisiting something that we've done, like for example, quite recently we had in February, we had a wonderful tour with Korean and Indian musicians and a very famous Indian dancer. It was called Same Same But Different. And this was a, a, a global uh, uh, project and this was India's turn to be part of it. The, the Korean group Noromachi had worked with very many groups all over the world to do different segments of this project. And what it essentially meant is that through research and development, through residencies in both countries, this was very carefully, respectfully developed and then toured. 
toured all around Korea and then toured all around India. So it went to iconic buildings. It worked with musicians in other in other cities. It it had such an expansive uh, feel to it, which when we brought online, we realized very quickly that first of all, when what we had uh, 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 videographed was meant not for streaming, but it was meant for our own archival purposes. So it meant that we had to repurpose that put the whole thing together more as producer rather than presenter so that you could simulate somewhat the excitement of that performance without you know doing having any discredit to the to, to the program per se so i think there's a lot of reflective thinking required in the manner in which we pick and choose what we aim to place online mm. but also understand that that online presence is very important whether it's going to be transitory we don't know well, it's going to become another complementary strand, but definitely next time post pandemic, when we record something, we're going to be doing it with three cameras. Thank, hopefully have a budget to do it that way. But then, you know, that's how you will be doing it in the, in the event of you might having to show this online. Yeah. So we might make those, those very administrative technical shifts. And whether the touring circuit will come on, I don't know, taking Heber's point, we've always worked with local and national partners. So they are all in this, we're all in this together. We've never presented any program on our own. And mm -hmm. developing those, where a lot of money and time, uh, time has gone into investing on building those relationships. So now when we are in this situation, we're all hand-holding to say we understand where you're coming from. What is it that we can do to pitch in to keep every one of us afloat? Mm, yeah. Well, uh, from my end, con concerning sector resilience, I've been, um, uh, I'm, I'm currently doing my PhD and it is about resilience. Um, I started it one year ago and it has never been more relevant than now. And uh, um, from my end, when we started the, the lockdown, I, I thought that the sector has to have a tool to, to navigate the future. And Having thought about this, I immediately uh, uh, initiated and co-founded Basita with uh, two other colleagues, uh, where we, we we think that maybe Basita would become a tool for the cultural sector to to be a bit more resilient, uh, in the sense of being able to generate income if uh, budget cuts persist. Um, because from what I've, I'm seeing here in the UAE, for example, and UAE is, is quite a, a generous country when it comes to supporting culture, uh, budgets are being cut. We are unable to program to uh, our programs until end of the year are being uh, postponed and cancelled because there are more priorities. So, and we were debating what about artists who, are, who live in the UAE? If we are unable to fly in artists from abroad, what about the artists who live in the UAE and their only source of income is performing or doing their art? So, yeah, that's from uh, from my end. Uh, what uh, what I've tried to contribute to uh, um, helping the sector become more resilient. So maybe Rafi, um, can you share with us your experience? Um, uh, some of your uh, projects where you explored the concept of culturepreneurship? Um, okay, this is, uh, this is something which actually underpins most of our work. And as I said, Inco Center is, music is one part of the work that we do. We also work with um, theater, dance, ceramic sculpture, painting. So it's visual arts and performing arts with several partners, about 20 in, or roughly 20 in Korea and, rough, and in India, and going from the local to regional to national. Um, so just to name a few, if it is the Korea Foundation, which is supported by the government, but it is specifically being set up to support the arts and the art, artistic endeavor in Korea, or the Arts Council in Korea, or the Korea Arts Management Service, or you know the Film Council, et cetera, et cetera, depending on the genre. Likewise, in India, we would have local partners who are presenting festivals. We would have, uh, so we wouldn't necessarily reinvent a festival. We would make sure we have a strong Korean presence at that festival or an Indo-Korean collaborative piece if we have worked to develop one. Yeah. So by culturepreneurship, one of what we meant is actively looking at how the cultural sector can interweave and work alongside private public, what we spoke about earlier, with 
corporate social responsibility because in india i don't know how it is in your part of the world but in india there is by law companies beyond a certain uh, when they have a certain profit in place they mm. can get a tax rebate by supporting cultural endeavor what yeah. comes under corporate yeah. social responsibility is probably the same and that varies in terms of the uh, the the sector that you're looking at whether it's health or education or culture now what makes it very difficult this is very good because this is one way of pitching for funds and they know that they are going to be all, they will be getting a very concrete benefit by doing mm-hmm. so and there's also a direct link to society but as with all of these very well intentioned uh, uh, laws it is so obfuscated and so difficult to understand that very often companies are not aware of what exactly qualifies for this and neither is the cultural sector so one of the things we are doing is really to sort of you know uh, bear that down and bring out the main facts to say okay this is here is why you need to support this the risk of, of placing everything on csr is also that at times like this when the economy is hard hit as you rightly said culture is what takes the hardest hit and the first hit yeah. and yes. therefore we got to continue making the point that this is important and while we may not make plans which go so much overboard that we ask for a huge hike in 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 support we will at least keep it even so that we don't rock the boat and i'm we really happy to say that all of the companies so the main two companies i mentioned we've got about 48 small and medium companies korean about 10 indian small and medium all maybe vendor companies to these big companies but whatever we do the 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 support has been incredible and mm. we have had to also therefore be very careful in the kind of projects we take up to see that there is a direct link not just to the community of artists but to society at large yeah. so for instance if we are working we are not a grant grant making body so we can't directly support artists in distress with a grant but mm. we will make sure that some kind of work comes through which is monetized So yeah. even if it is a performance online it will be under contract it will be monetized if it's a virtual collaboration there will still be an honorarium and a fee going into it etc so minus the physical tours we will mm. try to do all other things so with yeah. cult- cultural entrepreneurship i thought more in terms of encouraging entrepreneurial innovative ventures but mm. also looking at the concept of enterprise so yes. enterprise like raid rightly said as an industry there is a monetary factor to it there is revenue there mm-hmm. is i mean artists always fight shy of this we've had several examples where we have collaborations and they say oh we don't mind doing this for free and we said don't ever do that because you'll skew the pitch for the somebody yeah. else coming in after you it's going to be very difficult to demand a fee but be reasonable yes, so we exactly. just take as the sort of middle ground to say when we are talking to partners and potential funders and artists let's be realistic about our expectation and not undercut anybody So yes. don't overprice yourself, but don't undersell yourself either. Yeah, we we are trying to do the same at the Cultural Foundation here, where all our perf- online performances are the artists they get a fee. Of course, it's uh, a bit less uh, than their normal fee if it's a uh, physical performance. And this is also the reason why we have uh, established uh, Bosita because through Bosita, artists can put their content online while being able to charge their audiences a ticket. So it functions as if. it's an a normal venue but virtual venue so that we can ensure um an income generation uh, mechanism for uh, for artists maybe also i can share with you another uh, partnership uh, um format that we are trying to explore we are still exploring uh during this period with which is uh like a triangle of uh, uh, of partnership between uh, donors Uh, venues or cultural institutions and our platform where we are aiming at um, uh, having the donors support the institution or the venue so that the venue can bring in young artists or artists in general to support them by um, giving them the, the venue to to mm. film their performances and upload it online for the artist to generate the income through the platform and the ticketing pl- the online ticketing platform so we're we're trying now to establish this format of partnership because uh, we we understand that also the venues are struggling they have canceled their performances and now some venues are open but with a very limited number of uh, seats and uh, some of them have 
uh, after some surveys, we've understood that some of them may not even be able to survive with this 30% or 50% of selling their uh, their house. So they still need to sell more than the 50% or 30% capacity. So we are trying now at this moment to explore this new format of partnership to see if it's going to be a good idea or a sustainable idea that would help uh, institutions, venues and artists maybe generate some income and be more resilient until this wave passes by. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, uh, back to you, Raed, um, maybe you can tell us um, if there is one thing that institutions could do to ensure the sustainability of the big uh, music festivals and that the, the ones that have large number of attendees that obviously have been disrupted at this moment, what could it be? Um, well, it would be the same phrase everyone has been using for the past five months, which is social, social distancing. <laughs> um, you'd have to use larger spaces of land, use outdoor venues, uh, venues only, and fewer people per square meter. Um, mm. Though I don't think that's going to be possible until something changes or a vaccine is found. Yeah. To, to, to be feasible. I mean, I don't think it's going to be feasible to do right now. Uh, people will still be either afraid to go out or it'll be too costly for some festivals to get even larger spaces for less people because less ticketing means, I mean, less revenue. And it could take a toll on a lot of promoters and a lot of uh, festival owners. Um, I'd say we just we would have to wait this one out, and for anyone anyone that's trying to do something online the next time, I would recommend wait till festivals are back, get a couple of people, strap loads of cameras on them, have them walk around the festival, and once if God forbids or whoever I mean just if a pandemic hits again or something like that happens, sell the VR experience for mm -hmm. festivals. Maybe that could be something interesting for people to, to try at home when they can't go out anymore. To go, I mean, I've never been to a festival, but okay, I'd like to try the virtual real, reality, I mean, festival and see what's that all about. Maybe while sitting at home, seeing other people, walking around a festival as if I was there. Maybe that would be something interesting or that could be the next step in uh, doing that. But as for real festivals, I'd say, we'd have to wait till at least 2021 and see what happens then. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I've, yeah. also through those surveys that we've been doing, uh, we've heard that, we've, we've read that uh, because of um, the income has been affected, family income has been affected. So for example, if you are um, a father and you want to go to a festival with your wife and like two, two kids, and you will be uh, obliged to buy four tickets uh, after the pandemic and um, the effect on some jobs, maybe this will, will not be possible, uh, no longer possible at all. And um, some people have told us that they now prefer the home-based entertainment more than um, going out to events or festivals. So maybe the VR experience would be something that uh, could be explored in the future um, and would be, would be beneficial for some households who have been affected heavily or whose income have been affected heavily uh, through That's the pandemic. That, that, that's true, but again, I think that as long as people can go out, and I can talk about from experience, at least in Jordan, what I've seen, people are hungry for events, people want to go out, they just want to be out there and they want to do something, they want to go to festivals, they want to go to concerts, they want to go back to the normal and regular lifestyles, they don't want to be cooped up at home, even if it costs them, they're willing to do it at this moment, at this point. Yeah. So I think it's always going to come be second best. I mean, anything online is going to be second best to the real thing, and it will never replace it, unfortunately. Yes. Let's hope that everything will come back to uh, close to normal very soon. And uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, check. Yes, please. Sorry, Reem. I just wanted to come in on what Raid was saying. I think the virtual reality experience would be fabulous but in a country like india for instance 
beyond uh, urban cities and again uh, a cross section of the urban populace just having the technology to experience this will be quite daunting at the moment oh, we're, we're facing this in fact right with uh, when we do online classes and demos and things like that that we have so many people who are hungry for it want to join but they don't have the necessary smartphone or a high speed internet connection or whatever it may be and that's a huge stumbling block so wondering right. how we can present it although it's a fabulous idea and i think we are going to have to invest in technology in a manner in which it humanizes if that's the word the humanizes the experience you know rather than technology which is flashy and overwhelms how can this be used as a tool to humanize the experience and get it to us in as close a fashion as possible yeah. i guess no yeah. if i can just um may i rim yes of course if i can just add i mean one one dimension of um dealing with the topic of you know what makes resilience happens is that sometimes we get caught into thinking about the the macro level of things the sector when in fact what we can try to do and this is something as a regional organization we have the privilege of seeing all of these incredible local small initiatives collectives institutions is to try and reinforce their own standing uh their own uh um existence basically because what happens in a in a crisis like the pandemic or in a in a in a war situation is that cultural entities to a large extent have very means to fall uh, to fall back and so the rate at which they may shut down or or you know close their operations or lose their spaces is so high that what we can as a, a regional organization or if we're thinking about strategic partnerships is to plan ahead and try to reinforce those institutions even before a crisis hits and and part of the resilience is that uh uh in a region like ours is that these institutions have time to reconsider what are the options if it's a health pandemic if it uh, uh you know a war zone like what we see in in so many places like yemen and syria and and uh sudan today i mean the idea is to make sure that they have the tools at hand and they have the sustained support to reexamine what makes them relevant in their community and how best can they adapt within their local resources um and and uh, and networks So one of the programs that we had running since 2018 and and which is we're very lucky to have had a partner who saw this long term vision with us is the arts and culture entrepreneurship program which does exactly that it tries to put these institutions in a situation where they have time to reflect to challenge themselves get out of their comfort zones look at models that are uh, alternative to what they they have whether it's social enterprises or in in cases where it is applicable to look at income generating options so that when they are caught in a difficult situation they're better able to handle but also to grow in their missions to add public value in the work that they do and another one which happened right before the pandemic this was last year was a partnership between AFOP and the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation um and what's what's brilliant is that we were able to support um since December 2019 just before the pandemic over 40 institutions so supporting them in their core and programmatic areas but also supporting collaboration and when the pandemic hit of course they were all caught off guard and had to revisit you know what is it that they can do how can they respond to their own audiences to their communities and some disciplines are much more hit than others i mean if you think of theater uh uh film you might say can be online but what do you do about dance performances how do you bring that experience yes. but what the program allowed them to do is to maintain their core team and to give them a sense of stability in a time where the funding could have been shortcut and where they would have had to shut down and so one of the un- unexpected um uh, positive aspects is that 
we, we managed to sustain them during a period of time where they had to rethink of a plan B and what to do uh, to remain resilient in this time, but also beyond, whether it's doing online programming or revisiting the very activities that they need to get on track in order to sustain themselves. Thank you very much. Absolutely. We have a question from the live stream chat, which says, can sponsors also get involved as a fourth leg to the triangle? And uh, yeah, I guess this question was um, uh, to me when I said mm -hmm. about the triangle of um, supporters. Yes, of course. Uh, why not? The sponsors sponsors would uh, would really add uh, more um, would add to the triangle, and it would also complement uh, uh, our conversation about uh, uh, um, having an arranged marriage between the private and uh, the public and cultural sector. Uh, in a meaningful way. Of course, sponsorship is something that is highly, highly needed at this time. May so, I add, uh, we can change, uh, we can alter the word and uh, the word and perspective slightly from from sponsors to partners. I yeah. think there'll be a huge difference in the manner in which the, the, you know, hierarchies are broken down and everybody brings a certain value to the table. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you very much. I, this uh, this was really a very insightful and uh, um, interesting conversation. I personally have enjoyed it uh, a lot. Um, if maybe I can give the word, uh, the final word, uh, to each of you to say uh, like a, a closing uh, remark and. Um, how about we start with the, with you, Raid? Um, first of all, thank you for hosting me and thank you for moderating uh, Reem. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet Rafi and Hiba as well. Um, and I want to tell just every artist out there, keep your head up, stay resilient. And if there's one thing this pandemic taught us is diversify. Diversify. Nobody is resilient enough through this. So just... Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Just choose like 20 of them and try to survive. That's it. Thank you, Rod. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Reem. Thank you, Reem. Uh, Heba, please. Thank you, uh, Reem. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, what I would like to end on is say that um, it's that this region, uh, and specifically, has seen its share of calamities. But it's also a region that, that in its with its uh, individual initiatives, with its collective in its initiatives, has been able to overcome a lot of crisis situations. This is not a new situation, and that's that's where one should have hope in how we've coped in the past but also in looking at uh, looking for allies and looking at our own local and regional networks to learn from each other and be in solidarity with, with one another. Um, and as a regional institution, again, we have the privilege to see all of this at work and we want to continue offering the space so that the, the space for freedom of expression and creativity continues because in these times, as in more tranquil times, it's very much needed. Yes, yes, I agree. Thank you so much, Heba. And Rossi, please. Thank you, Reem, for moderating this session, and Rai and Heba for being such wonderful conversationalists and co-panelists. Um, I think that what is needed during this time, and especially from all that we spoke about resilience, is the ability to be nimble, to ability to be re to to reinvent yourself quickly, not to hold on to too much, uh, without letting go stubbornly, because that way is doom. So, without giving up on your core principles, how do you diversify? How do you reinvent? How do you repurpose? How do you stay relevant? So, in order to do that with all stakeholders, I think there's a need for great compassion a lot of communication and continued commitment. So without those three C's, I think it would be very difficult for all of us as a sector itself 
to go forward. So thanks very much. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you to Global Toronto and to uh, uh, everyone else who's made this possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, and I would like to say thank you to uh, Lama Hasbun or, as well. I know yes. uh, she's one of the pillars uh, of the culture scene in Jordan, and I know how hard she works, so thank you. Yes, thank you, Lama. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Lama, and thank you all. And uh, my final, uh, my final remark is uh, again about communication. Thank you, uh, Rasi, for mentioning uh, the three Cs. But I want to uh, uh, elaborate on the importance of communication because sometimes we all do the same thing, but we don't talk to each other. And if only we talk to each other, we may have stronger and deeper and longer impact. So I would like to encourage everyone to stay connected and let's uh, keep in touch and uh, learn from each other as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, so before you go, uh, there has to, they need to take a screenshot for like a photo. <laughs> photo um, on the bus. So let's uh, just, uh, yeah. Let's do exactly what we've been doing for the past hour. Just look at the screen. <laughs> Just there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh